talking on the chat window, so if you have questions, I will be able to see them. Um, so I want to... Just, sorry, one comment which I forgot to make. Uh, I'm going to make a recording of this session. So uh, hopefully this uh, seminar will be accessible online uh, afterwards, uh, although it might take a few days for the link to be uh, active. Okay, go on, of you. Very cool, Ron. Yeah. So I'll start by uh, reviewing some uh, statistical properties of permutations. And then I will uh, continue on to discuss uh, analogs of this result in the integers. Uh, Alon asks if I can make it full screen. If I make it full screen, I won't be able to see the chat window, I think. So maybe, maybe if there's a question, you just have to use the microphone to ask it and not the chat window then. Uh, so I'll use, I'll use the, the full screen. And if anyone will have a question, Please ask it on the microphone. So I'm making it full screen. So. I, I will still see the chat window. So if you write something in the chat and you, for some reason, cannot use your microphone, I can intervene and, uh, and tell that there is a question. One second. I removed all the menus. So now it's harder to make full screen. OK. So I start by reviewing some statistical properties of permutations. So uh, pi n will be a random, randomly drawn permutation from Sn, drawn uniformly. C pi will denote the number of cycles in a permutations in a permutation, and C i of pi will be the number of cycles of a given length i. And moreover, I order the cycles in a non-increasing order. So L1 of pi is the largest cycle, L2 of pi is the second largest, and so on. So first I review some uh, basic facts about permutations that are uh, very useful. So one is Cauchy's formula. Cauchy's formula is a formula uh, for the probability that a random permutation has a given number of cycles of each size. So the probability that the permutation has exactly ai cycles of length i for each i is this product on the right uh, hand side this product of one over ai factorial times i to the ai it's a uh, an exercise to prove it and another useful fact is that the length of the cycle containing a given element is distributed uniformly among uh, one up to n so as an example of this, the probability that the cycle that contains the element 1 as the size i is 1 over n regardless of i. So now uh, I'll continue to use some asymptotic results. So uh, the probability that the number of cycles is exactly 1, well, there is no asymptotics here. It's exactly 1 over n. This, uh, for instance, follows from the last fact or fr from each of the two facts I've mentioned. A second fact is about the expected number of cycles. So the expected number of cycles is the harmonic number Hn, which grows like log n up to a constant. Uh, this is a slightly more uh, deeper fact, but still elementary. Uh, in 41, Goncharov proved that the number of cycles uh, the variance of the number of cycles grows like log n. So the variance and the expectation are of the same order of magnitude. And he also proved some sort of uh, central limit theorem. So he proved that once we normalize the number of cycles, uh, this random variable tends in distribution to a standard normal uh, distribution. The reason I would use the word CLT is that you can write the number of cycles as the num as a sum of indicator uh, var random variables. The indicator function, um, for instance, of the number of cycles of size i. So you can write it as some sort of uh, sum of random variables, which are not independent, but they have some sort of they have enough independence in them. Uh, another result is, is of is of Shep and Lloyd from sixty six. They prove that once we normalize the, num the length of the largest cycles, so we take L1 divided by N, take L2 divided by N, and so on, 
this infinite vector tends in distribution to a Poisson, uh, po to a Poisson Dirichlet uh, distribution with parameter one. Now, this is a distribution that it's uh, somewhat uh, complicated to define, but I will define it later in the talk. For right now, it doesn't matter the precise distribution. Uh, and the point, one point I want to make is that all these results have integer analogs. And next, I'm going to discuss uh, some of these analogs. So let us set up the setting. Uh, we take nx to be an integer chosen uniformly at random from the integers from 1 to x. And uh, uh, we know that... Uh, by Euclid, that all the integers can be factored uh, essentially in a unique way to primes. So let us call P1 uh, the largest prime, P2 the second largest prime. Um, and the main idea is that prime factors are analogous to cycles, uh, the same way that we can write a uh, permutation as a product of these joint cycles, we can write an integer as a product of primes. And so the analog of the number of cycles is the, uh, is the function omega n, which just counts the number of prime factors of n. Now, omega n counts the number of prime factors without multiplicity. Cities and the results won't be changed too much. I just want to make sure, uh, Ron, am I still being heard? Um, great. I just didn't have any feedback, so I wanted to know. Thanks. So, so it's analogous to pi n. And a, a very basic question is, what's the probability that the number of cycles is one? Or in the integer setting, this means that the, are the number I picked is a prime. Um, and uh, Gauss and Legendre uh, conjectured in the, the 790s that this grows like, this probability uh, grows like 1 over log x, or decays like 1 over log x. And this was eventually proved independently by Adamar and by De La Vallee Poisson in 19, uh, 1896. So this is the probability that a permutation is prime, meaning it has one cycle is one over n, and this was very elementary. But the prime number theorem is considerably harder. Uh, so it's analog, but it's much uh, deeper. And next, one wants to understand uh, uh, the distribution of the number of, of prime factors of a random integer. And there is a standard computation one can do. I write a standard in parentheses because it's standard for people in analytic number theory, but not necessarily for people outside that field. So we can write uh, the, this random variable omega as a sum of indicator random variables, one for each prime. So omega is the sum of the indicator uh, random variables, one. Uh, of the event that p divides my number. So for each prime, I have the random variable, p divides my number. And this allows us to write this expectation as the sum of probabilities that p divides my number. And uh, the probability that p divides my number is roughly one over p, right? Because there are uh, roughly x over p multiples of p. And there is a narrow term of one over x, and you can use the prime number theorem from the previous slide to show that this sum of, of one over p grows like log log x. But in fact, you don't really need PNT. This fact is uh, more elementary and it was known uh, before uh, the, the prime number theorem. So we know that what's the expectation of uh, the number of prime factors of a random integer? But what can we say about the distribution? Is it concentrated around log log x? Well, the answer is positive. This is a result of Ardi and Ramanujan from 1917. They said the following, let us take a function g that grows to infinity, can grow to infinity as loss we want. 
then the probability that omega, the distance from omega to log log x is less than square root of log log x times this function, uh, this probability tends to one. Or in other words, the probability that I'm uh, further from log log x by this quantity g times square root log log x, this probability decays to zero. Yeah, one can look on the complement event. So I'll briefly sketch the proof of this result of R.D. Ramanujan also, and Ramanujan, uh, but later I'll give a much simpler proof for a stronger result by Turan. So this is the sketch of the proof. So Landau used the prime number theorem to compute the probability that there are k prime factors. The probability that the number of prime factors is precisely k. So he obtained this expression, which is very similar to the, uh, the distribution of a Poisson random variable with parameter log log x. So he added this formula, but he only added for fixed k. So Ardi and Ramanujan adapted uh, his proof uh, to obtain a uniform version, a uniform version of this estimate, meaning uniform in k. But they lost the asymptotics. They only get an upper bound. So they proved that the probability that I have exactly k prime factors is bounded from above by a certain quantity, which is, again, very similar to Uh, the variable. They proved this upper bound and then they summed this probability, the probability that the number of prime factors is k, they summed it for k in the range uh, Arjun Ramanujan. They summed over k that are uh, that k minus log log x is greater than g times square root log log x. So they, they estimated the complement event, and they get an upper bound of the complement event, and the upper bound was good enough uh, for them to be able to show that it goes to zero. So that's the proof. It's a very technical proof, and we won't need it later in the talk. But now let us present a much modern proof by Turan. So Turan said, OK, we can compute the variance. He computed the variance of this random variable. He proved that It grows like Shev's inequality to deduce this theorem of Ramanujan and the Hardy. This is what's known as the second moment method. If the second moment uh, is, is small enough, we understand something about the concentration. Uh, okay, so now after we understand the first and the second moment of the number of prime factors, let us discuss the Erdoshkat theorem. So in 1940, uh, Erdos and Katz proved that once we normalize the function omega, the random variable omega, uh, then it tends in distribution to a normal, to a standard normal uh, random variable. And the heuristic for this result is the same as in the case of permutations. We can write omega as a sum of indicator functions, the indicator of the event that p divides my number. And they are not independent, but there is enough independence there to exploit and to prove this. And uh, I hope that by the end of the talk, you will know uh, how to make this uh, argument uh, more rigorous. Um, cause, because historically, this heuristic existed before, but it took time until people were able to formalize it. Uh, I think the story that Lior told me is that Katz uh, conjectured this Erdos heard it and was able to use uh, theory and numbers. Uh, so after we discussed uh, the number of prime factors of a random integer, let us discuss the largest prime factors of a random integer. So Dickman proved in 1930 that if I take the logarithm of the largest prime factor, what I denoted as P1, and I, I take the logarithm and divide by log x, then this quantity has an explicit limiting distribution. And moreover, this limiting distribution, it has a, a continuous density function. 
So in the literature, people often define uh, the following function known as Dickman's row function. So row view is defined as the limit of the event that P1, the largest prime factor, is at most x to the 1 over u. So as I mentioned, this is continuous. Uh, and moreover, uh, it has a very nice definition in terms of a delay integral equation. You can define the value of rho of u uh, if you know the value of rho on the interval u minus 1 up to u. And this function is very useful when people analyze certain So the applications of, of although Dickman uh, was just uh, wasn't motivated by this motiv this uh, applications. So as I say, Dickman studied the largest prime factor, and, and later Billingsley in 1972 studied all the prime factor, all the large prime factors. After P1 normalized, and then the second largest one, and so on. And in this way, uh, one obtains an uh, infinite vector of non negative uh, uh, real numbers that are non decreasing, uh, sorry, non increasing. And turns out that this infinite vector, as x tends to infinity, converges in distribution to the Poisson Dirichlet distribution with parameter 1, which I promised to tell you about. on the talk. Uh, so one takeaway is that you should take as x to the uh, O of 1. That's the right normalization you should take when uh, in this result of Billingsley, uh, one normalizes the, the largest prime factor by taking logarithm uh, in base x. So that's one takeaway. And the second takeaway is that this is the same distribution that we already saw in the case of permutations when we studied the largest uh, cycles of our random permutation. Uh, I want to mention a small word about history. So I mentioned this distribution repeatedly, this Poisson Dirichlet distribution, uh, but this it was actually defined after Billings three results, Billings three re result, and after Shape and Lloyd's result. Uh, so they didn't state the result in terms of distribution, they just computed the density functions. And later this distribution uh, was studied uh, by Kingman and people realized that this is distribution that appeared in all these previous works. Uh, so after I surveyed results about permutations and, and uh, integers, let us summarize the analogy that we saw. So this table, uh, summarizes uh, what we saw. In the first uh, column, we see results about permutations, about this random variable pi n. In the right column, we see results about this random variable nx. And we see that uh, the probability of having one cycle is 1 over n. And in the integer world, the probability of having one prime factor is asymptotic to 1 over log x. In the permutation world, the expected number of cycles and the variance of the number of cycles both grow like log n. And in the integer world, the number of prime factors and the variance of the number of prime factors, uh, sorry, the expected, the expectation of the number of prime factors and the variance of the number of prime factors both grow like log log x. We see that both in the permutation world and the integer world, we have a central limit theorem for the number of cycles and the number of prime factors. And we see that once we normalize the largest cycles or the largest prime factors, in both cases, we obtain the same limiting distribution. So we can see that, at least informally, permutations on n elements and their statistics behave like uh, integers of order x. Once I take n to uh, grow like log x, if in all these results n 
<laughs> there are many more results that prove that this analogy is, is something real and fruitful. Um, many of them are surveyed in this recent book of Andrew Granville and Jennifer Granville. It's a graphic novel called Prime Suspect that, uh, again, uh, uh, studies this analogy from a historic perspective and from many angles. Uh, and I won't have time to explore all the analogies of integers and permutation, but I uh, suggest this book for further reading. And before I start talking about the Ewan's measure, uh, I want to ask the audience if there are any questions before I continue. So let me again explain to those who joined that at the bottom of your screen, you have an icon of a camera and an icon of a microphone, and they start out orange. And if you click on them, they become green. And when they're green, then we can see you if you clicked on the camera or we can hear you if you clicked on the microphone. Another possibility for you is to write in the chat window. So I see that uh, uh, as a, as a wrong conjecture. Yeah, his conjecture was slightly uh, off. Ophir, uh, scroll down in the chat window. You can see that the last comment is by uh, Misha Sodin. He asks about uh, a question. So can you tell, uh, so Misha is asking, can you tell something about the distribution of the largest prime in the factorization? Well, uh, Th that, that's the result of of, uh, of uh, Dickman. He proved that once I take the largest prime factor, I take the logarithm of that quantity of that prime in log in in log in, in, in logarithm to base x, then I get a quantity that has a limit. I'll give a conceptual way to think about the distribution when I'll define the Poisson distribution later in the talk. So I, I'll get back to that question, how exactly one defines the Poisson distribution, the Poisson Dirichlet distribution. I'll get to that. Yeah, so Goncharov indeed computed, gave explicit, explicit uh, uh, formulas for it, well, they weren't uh, exactly uh, very illuminative, I think, but they, he gave, yeah, he gave, he gave formulas that uh, one can use. And in fact, using these formulas, one can use this, in, one can prove this integral delay equation that I've mentioned, that I've stated also. Um, I see Tom Mayorovich raised his hand. Uh, Tom, click on your microphone and uh, ask your question. So, uh, is this uh, a heuristic analogy, just a heuristic, or is there actually kind of a, you know, a common uh, argument or is a formal connection? Okay, th th that's a good question. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there is no like meta theorem or a, some big theorem, some master theorem that allows you to translate results in one word to the other. But oftentimes the ideas or the proofs can, can be adapted from one setting to the other, but this is mostly a heuristic. I guess that for specific types of result, you, can, you might prove some kind of transference result. That if something like that holds in permutation, then it holds in integers. But I think that you will fail to prove something general enough to, to capture this entire analogy. And moreover, there are some places where this analogy is less accurate or somewhat off. So, uh, so I hope that answered the question. Uh, there isn't a theorem, as far as I'm aware, that proves that allows you to transfer a result from one setting to the other. You have to take a proof and modify it, or try to modify it. Does that answer the question, Tom? Tom wrote yes in the chat window. I think I'm in full screen. The I'm chat in window screen. went in full screen, um, but uh, um, but maybe we'll manage to find a fix for that at some point. Uh, this is uh, our first attempt. Yeah. 
Okay, so thank for the question. Don't see other questions. Yeah, uh, so unless there are other questions, I will continue to define the UN's permutation, the UN's measure. Um, so what is this? What is the U.S. measure? So the U.S. measure comes with a parameter theta, a positive real parameter, and it's a measure on the symmetric group, which gives a permutation pi a probability that's proportional to theta raised to the number of cycles. So, for instance, if theta is greater than one, then this measure prefers cycles with uh, permutation with more cycles. Uh, something that is useful to know when working with this uh, measure is the normalizing constant, right? We have to know the asymptotics of uh, theta to the number of cycles averaged over the symmetric group. This actually has a closed form, this constant, and it grows like some power of n. Uh, and and this uh, measure arose originally in population genetics. It arose in a paper about genetics by Ewens from 1972, hence the name Ewens measure. And I don't know a lot of about genetics, uh, but I can tell you about restaurants and how to uh, generate uh, this measure using a process called the Chinese restaurant process. It's a very elegant process. So uh, imagine that there are N customers that enter a restaurant. Eventually, we'll consider a permutation on these customers. So the customers are labeled. So customer number one, he comes and he sits at the first table. We can imagine that the tables are, are labeled, although it doesn't matter. Uh, so when the case customer comes, he has two choices. He can decide to sit uh, right to one of the previous K minus one customers, or so what are the probabilities that I assign for the decisions of this customer? So there are K minus one customers that he can see to the right of, and the probability that he sits to the right of a specific customer is one over Theta plus k minus one. This is the probability that I, that I assign. And there is also the probability to the complement event that it doesn't sit next to uh, any of these customers and opens a new table. And the probability to this has to be um, after they all sit on the tables. I can look at uh, each table as being a cycle. We, we pick some orientation. We pick some orientation to the cycles, and then we have uh, uh, just the cycles of the permutations, of the permutation. So this process gives a measure on permutations, and it turns out that this measure is precisely the UN's uh, measure with parameter theta. Uh, so let us... Uh, uh, well, I want to note the two facts. One is that when theta equals one, then note that these probabilities, they are all one over K. All these probabilities are one over K. So all the possible choices that the customer makes have the same uh, probability. And I think that for theta equals one, you might have seen this process. And the second is that this exercise that I say is actually, uh, I'll tell you how to solve it. So once we multiply all these probabilities, after all these customers sit down and, uh, and they pick their decisions with certain probabilities, and, and I multiply these uh, probabilities, the denominator will always be the same. The denominator of, uh, each, uh, per, of the probability to pick each permutation will always be this product of theta plus k minus one, where k ra ranges from uh, one to n minus one. Um, sorry, ranges from two uh, to n, and the the, no, the, no, the numerator will just be precisely theta to the number of cycles. Because if you don't open a new cycle, a new table, then the number the numerator will be one. So the, the numerator of the probability of a given permutation 
will exactly be theta to the number of cycles uh, divided by a certain uh, quantity. So it's a, it's a, it's a, I solved you the exercise. So uh, let us now uh, survey some results on this measure, on this uh, quite natural measure. So one result is by Hansen from 1990. Um, she studied uh, uh, the number of uh, cycles in this, uh, in this uh, Ewens measure. And the number of cycles and the variance both grow like theta log n which is consistent with the case of theta equals one. Theta equals one is just the uniform measure, if I didn't mention that. And we also have a central limit theorem. Again, once we normalize the number of cycles in the Ewens measure, it tends in distribution to a normal uh, distribution. A second result is by Watterson from 76, and it concerns uh, the largest uh, cycles in the Ewens measure. So once I normalize the largest cycle by n and the second largest by n and so on, I obtain a vector, an infinite vector, that converges in distribution to the Poisson Dirichlet distribution with parameter theta. Again, I didn't define this distribution yet, but I'm getting close to it. So these are some classical results about the Ewens measure. And now I want to tell you how uh, Dor and I, how we defined uh, some analog of this measure of the Ewens measure on integers. Um, so I guess the most natural analog that one can come up with for a Ewens measure on integers is the following. Let us pick an integer n between one and x with a probability that's proportional to theta to the number of prime factors. Again, because the number of prime factors is analogous to the number of cycles. Um, or we can do the same with capital omega instead of uh, little omega, where capital omega counts uh, the number of prime factors with multiplicities. Um, but we took this analogy uh, further. We noticed that theta to the omega is what's known in number theory as a multiplicative function. So what's a multiplicative function? It's a function uh, on the integers, from the integers to the complex numbers, uh, from the positive integers to the complex numbers, such that f uh, of a product of two co-prime numbers, n and m, is just f of the first number multiplied by f of the second number. And notice the condition that n and m are co-prime. So I don't require it for all n and m, only for co-prime ones. So it's uh, more relaxed than you would have guessed, maybe. And, and theta to the little omega is indeed a multiplicative function, right? Because the number of fa prime factors of n times m, if n and m are co-prime, is the number of prime factors of n plus the number, number of prime factors of m. So this theta to the omega is indeed a, a uniform, is indeed a, a multiplicative function. And the point is that the multiplicative functions are ubiquitous in number theory. They appear in many different contexts. So we asked ourselves, what would happen if we would sample an integer n uh, with a probability proportional to fn, where f is some multiplicative function, some non-negative multiplicative function. And that leads us, leads us to the main theorem. Uh, oh, sorry, before I'll, before I'll state the main theorem, I, I, I'll give some examples of multiplicative functions in number theory to convince you that they are indeed very uh, common in number theory. Okay, so uh, the first example is the function that is one if n is a sum of two squares and zero otherwise. Here I must say that it's not trivial that it's multiplicative. It's relatively easy to see that if two numbers of, are sums of two squares, then their product is also a sum of two squares. That's not too hard. What's harder is that if I have a number that is a sum of two squares and I write it as a product of two co-prime integers, then these two integers must as well be sums of two squares. And this actually, this fact is, is uh, related to our classical result of Fermat. So that's a non-trivial example. 
Uh, a second example that is somewhat more uh, uh, basic is dn, which is the number of divisors of n. This stands for divisors. So it's just the function that counts all the divisors of n, including 1, including n, so not necessarily prime divisors. So this is a multiplicative function. And I also want to show you a way how I can sample an integer in a natural way uh, in such a way that the probability distribution will be proportional to d of n. So let's see. I pick a random pair of integers a comma b uh, under the restriction that the product is at most x. And then I pick my random variable n to be the product of a times b. So n will always be an integer between 1 and x. And you can see that the probability to obtain a given number n will be proportional to the number of divisors. There is a, a geometric way to sample uh, numbers according to this. And we can take fn to be an, the number of abelian groups of order n up to isomorphism. So this is also a uh, multiplicative. And again, there is a natural way to, samples, to sample integers according to this distribution. If I take a random abelian group of order at most n, then I'll just take my random variable to be the order of this random group. I'll finish with two more exotic examples. So let us take some polynomial p with integer coefficients. And I can take f of n to be the number of roots of p modulo n. And by the Chinese remainder theorem, this will be multiplicative. And the final example, example number five, is an indicator function. It's one if this polynomial is some root modulo n, and it's zero otherwise. And again, it's multiplicative by the Chinese remainder theorem, or because the previous example was multiplicative. So this is just a small sample of multiplicative functions. They appear all over number theory. Um, so now I'm going to state the main result uh, of Doran myself, and then we'll see what it tells us about some of these specific examples. So this is the main result. Uh, so suppose I take some multiplicative function f. And suppose that I sample an integer n from 1 to x with probability proportional to f, to f of n. Um, so I, in the U.S. measure, I had a parameter theta. The parameter theta uh, was somehow related to the weights I give to, 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 to cycles. Because cycles are primes, it's, it's natural to think of theta as f of p, as the value of f on, on primes. Uh, but the thing is that the value of f on primes doesn't necessarily have to be constant. So we think of theta as the average of f over primes. So formally, I assume that the average value of f on primes tends to a limit theta sufficiently fast. So the error term should be log 1 over log x to the eighth power where a, for any positive a. Uh, this might sound restrictive, but for all examples that uh, we are of, aware of that appear in number theory, this is a condition that is being met. Um, so under the condition that f satisfies this uh, uh, convergence to theta on primes, then the number of prime factors of this random integer normalized properly tends to normal distribution. In particular, uh, we proved that the expectation of omega uh, is asymptotic to theta log log x. And the second result is about the largest prime factors of this random variable. So when I take log of the largest prime factor of my a random integer, divide by log x and do it for uh, all the prime factors, then this uh, converges to the Poisson Dirichlet distribution with parameter theta. And notice how this agrees with results that we've seen 
about the UN's measure, where the largest prime factors, the largest cycles, sorry, uh, tend in distribution to a Poisson distribution with para Poisson Dirichlet distribution with parameter theta, and the number of cycles uh, of um, a random UN's permutation. Uh, Sorry, there's a question. Alon Shalmash, Alon was asking, are there no assumption about prime powers? Thank you, Alon. Thank you. I, I, I was trying to make the theorem elegant, but if I press the button, we must impose some gross condition on prime power. So thank you, Alon. I assume that the value of F on P to the K uh, doesn't grow faster than um, uh, C to the K. So in, in almost all examples that we are of, aware of, f of p to the k grows at most polynomially with k. So again, this is a very mild restriction, but we do have to uh, require some sort of growth restriction because otherwise we can come up with examples where this fails. Because if on, some, on the power of 2 to the k it grows too fast, it means I give too much weight to integers with many uh, factors of 2. And this can change the distribution and change the results. So we have to impose some condition. We don't know if our condition is optimal, but it is satisfied for all interesting examples. Uh, so does that answer the question? OK, I'll take the silence for yes. Uh, so I was saying that these results agree with what we saw about the U.S. measure. So just let me get back a few slides back. So this matches up with results of Hansen about the number of cycles of a UN's uh, permutation and of Waterson on the number on the largest uh, cycles of uh, a random UN's permutation. Um, yeah, and we must impose some condition on prime powers. Um, now, before I go on about the proof ideas, I want to, again, stop and ask if there are any questions. I wanted to ask whether the case that um, F is just indeed the theta to the number of uh, divisors, theta to the omega of, uh, e, of N, was that case uh, studied before? So, there was a result uh, uh, of uh, Aratia, I think, uh, and several collaborators who studied the special case of theta to the omega. Uh, they studied it in the context, I think, uh, only on the context of largest prime factors, not on the context of cycles. Yes, but thank you, Rob, for the question. Some special cases of this result, of this result were known. So, for instance, for theta to the omega, this was a uh, uh, at least the second part of the theorem was known. Uh, I don't remember uh, from the top of my head who proved it, but it was, I think, Aratia and several collaborators. And I know that people studied um, the largest prime factor of an integer, which is a sum of two squares. Um, so there was also this result. There were several special cases of this result known. But uh, nothing, unif nothing in, nothing in uh, general form. Yeah, so some, some interesting cases of this result were known. Uh, thank you, Ron, for the question. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. Uh, we, may we mentioned previous works and that uh, uh, we, s we surveyed the previous works in our paper. Uh, but for instance, for theta to the omega, I th the result about the number of prime factors wasn't known. So how much time do I have left? Uh, about uh, 13 minutes? We end at uh, 3.30. Um, because of some technical difficulties, we started a few minutes late. We can also go, say, two minutes after 3.30. OK, so I'll continue. I'll continue with the proofs, with the sketch of the proofs, and also use the opportunity to define uh, the poisson dirichlet process. We've already defined the UN's measure and an analog of it on the integers. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Zev. I won't ask again. Uh, so I'll go on with the proof and also uh, we'll define uh, the Poisson uh, Dirichlet distribution. Uh, 
uh, yes, Ev, it's important to have some sense of humor in these uh, hard uh, times. So, yeah. <laughs> so, I'll start with a common ingredient in all of these proofs. It's an ingredient, although most of the proof is probabilistic in nature, like in the permutation setting, uh, there, is a, there, is a, there is an ingredient, a recent ingredient that's coming from analytic, analytic number theory. It's a result of Granville and Kokolopoulos, which uh, allows us to compute the normalizing constant for our distribution and certain other quantities, computes the asymptotics of several other quantities that appears that appear in our computations. And the technical work basically says the following, the basic the technical result basically says the following. If I have a multiplicative function that's on average theta on primes, and its growth on prime powers is not that big, is not that fast, then uh, the asymptote, the average value of f of n grows like some power of log x times a very precise constant. This constant takes into account the values of f on, on the various primes. I wrote here alpha in the last equation, that's a typo, it's supposed to be f. Um, so there is some power, precise power of log and a precise constant af, which depends on the value of f on primes. So that's a common ingredient that wasn't available until recently. Uh, but now let us get into some of the more uh, probabilistic ideas. So let us first focus on the result about the number of prime factors. So uh, first of all, we make several simplifications that now I'm going to talk about. And after these simplifications in the next slide, I will uh, talk about a beautiful idea of Billingsley that allows us to, to prove the result with very few computations. So let us start with the, with the simplifications. So the probability that P divides my random integers, we can approximate it uh, well enough by alpha P over P. Uh, I won't be very precise here what I mean by approximate and in what range, but the point is that this approximation... Um, alpha, is, uh, alpha is F of... Yeah, uh, thank you, Ron. In, in this slide and the previous slide, yeah, in this slide, every occurrence of alpha should be F. That's a, a typo that I had. A recurring typo. So, so you should think of alpha as f. Yeah, thank you. And sorry for the typo. So the probability that p divides my random variable is approximated very well by f of p over p. And uh, this allows us to replace our random variable with a slightly more convenient creature, this bx. So bx is a uh, it contains a, a sum of indicators, the indicator that P divides my, my random uh, number. And instead of subtracting a theta log log X, I subtract this sum of alpha P over P. And the reason that I'm allowed to do this is again, because alpha P over P is indeed a good approximation for the probability, at least in a certain range. Uh, again, I don't want, to, don't want to get into the technical details, but this shape of the random variable will help us. And a second thing that we used here, apart from the appearance of fp over p, is a truncation that's also very useful where we throw away small primes and very large primes. And very small primes and very large primes, if we uh, select the thresholds properly, you can actually prove relatively easy that they won't contribute to this random variable once normalized. So we throw away certain primes uh, and in the next slide, I'm going to explain how it helps us. So now when I look at P of X, uh, I really want to apply uh, some sort of central limit theorem. I have here a sum of random variables and because I subtracted alpha P over P, which is F of P over P, this thing has mean roughly zero. Uh, but we don't have a CLT for this kind of, uh, in this kind of setting. So I introduced the following random variable C of X. So what is C of X? It's again, a sum over primes. 
in the same range. But here I have something that I can deal with. I have a Bernoulli random variable that attains the value one with probability alpha p over p. And again, I subtract its expectation and divide by the standard deviation. So for this creature Cx, um, we have a CLT. So we know that uh, the distribution uh, of Cx tends to normal, but we can say more. We can actually compute the moments, uh, all the moments of Cx and see that they match uh, with the moments of uh, a normal distribution. Um, and now uh, the, the interesting idea of Billingsley, which, so Billingsley had the original proof for the Erdrich-Katz theorem and Dor and I adapted it to this, to our setting. So the idea is we're not going to compute the moments of Bx. We're not going to compute the moments, whereas we are going to compare the moments of Bx with the moments of this Cx. What do I mean by compare? We're actually going to subtract the moments of Bx from the moments of Cx, and we're going to bound this difference. And so, and, and we can prove that it's small enough. How can we prove that it's small enough? Basically, to prove that it's small enough, we have to be able to say things of the following uh, uh, flavor, we should be able to say that the probability that my number n is divisible by distinct primes qi is well approximated by this product of fqj over qj. So once we are able to show this kind of, of estimate, which we are able to do using this result of, the, of a Granville and Kokolopoulos, then we can actually bound the difference of the moments. So at no point do we compute the moments of Bx, but whether we compute the moments of Cx using some sort of CLT, using a strong form of CLT, which gives us moments, and then we compare the moments of Cx to Bx, we're able to show uh, that the moments of Bx, at least asymptotically, match with moments of a normal distribution. And then that's enough to say that Bx is a normal distribution as well. Uh, so that's the sketch of the proof. Um, again, there are some technical details that related to this truncation, but they shouldn't worry you. And if we didn't truncate, then we, weren't, we wouldn't have been able to compare the moments well. But we can truncate because the small primes and the large primes they they we can we can use other methods to show that they are negligible. For instance, to show that the small primes are negligible, we just use the fact that there are few primes up to the threshold that we used. That's all. So bounding small primes is very easy. Bounding large primes, the contribution of larger primes is slightly uh, more uh, technical, but uh, it's not a big deal. So any questions about uh, this proof? I have a question. Uh, you said that for the UN's permutation that you have a nice uh, sampling method via the Chinese restaurant process. Right. Is there any analog of that sometimes, maybe for specific functions f that can help you? Uh, th that's a good question, Ron. Uh, I'm not aware of an analog of the Chinese restaurant process, although there might, there might be one. The only examples where I know how to sample uh, a random integer according to this process is the examples I've mentioned here where I take, for instance, the number of divisors. So here I've mentioned a geometric way to sample. I consider the curve uh, A times B less than X, and I pick a random, uh, in, a random lattice point below this curve. And then I take N to be the product of A times B. So there, I'm sure there are variants of this, um, but uh, I'm not aware of a general analog of uh, a general way to sample integers according to this measure. Um, okay. uh, does that answer uh, the question, Ron? Yes. Thanks. Yeah. So so there might I mean the 
for some of these uh, functions, we, ha we have a way. Uh, for others, we don't, but all these functions appear in nature. So, yeah. Um, I guess you're asking because once we have a nice sampling method, we can try and prove something using the sampling method. Was that your line of thought? Yeah, that's right. Uh, the Chinese restaurant process helps you to prove uh, such central limit theorem results. Yeah. So I'm not aware of something general. That's why we, I guess, have to resort to this, to the method of proof that we use here. So uh, to summarize, uh, we want to apply some sort of CLT, but we can't. Uh, we want to compute moments, but that's quite, te quite technical. So instead, we do a comparison of moments. Um, and the, uh, made the main, uh, the main uh, new ideas here were to actually uh, show that this probability that n is divisible by uh, a list of distinct primes can be approximated by a certain uh, product of fqj over qj. Uh, but the idea of using comparison of moments is due to be links. Uh, now I'm going to the very final part of the proof. I know I'm running. I'm close to running out of time, so I'll do it briefly. But the idea is sort of not to use the Poisson Dirichlet distribution directly. So let me uh, tell you what's the Poisson Dirichlet distribution. Suppose I have a, a sequence of iid variables u1, u, u2, and so on with distribution beta one theta on the interval theta uh, zero to one. I can define variables x1. They have a formula here, but the point here is that you should think of them as what's known as the stick-breaking process. These xi's are defined in a way that makes their sum uh, converge to one almost surely. Um, so x1 uh, is just u1, just this random uh, variable u1. x2 is going to be a random variable whose value is between zero and one minus u1. So we always pick the next xi uh, out of one minus the previous uh, uh, xi's. That's why it's known as the stick break process. So that's a relatively simple process. But once we sort these xi's in, uh, in non-increasing order, we obtain a new uh, distribution called the Poisson distribu distribution with parameter theta. This is the Poisson Dirichlet distribution with parameter theta. I hope this gives you, uh, this, this finally answers what's this distribution, although we define it through the gem distribution, the distribution of the xi's, which are not ordered. So a nice property of the Poisson Dirichlet distribution is that we can use it to generate back the gem distribution. How can we do that? Uh, so let us define what's a size-based permutation of yi. Given a sequence of, uh, uh, of let's say, numbers yi with a, fine, with a finite sum, and suppose that they are distinct for simplicity, then yi tilde is a random variable that takes the value yj with probability proportional to yj. And in general, yi tilde will be equal to uh, yj where I only look with, with probability proportional to yj, so if y2 was chosen, I don't look at it any, anymore. So if I had a sequence of random variables that add the distribution, uh, add the Poisson distribution, uh, Poisson Dirichlet distribution with parameter theta, and then I do this size bias permutation of them, then this size bias permutation behaves like gem with parameter theta. Gem is this simpler distribution. And moreover, from this yi tilde, I can reconstruct a, a sequence of random variables that behave like beta with parameter one theta. I reconstruct it by dividing yi tilde by one minus the previous yi tilde. I'm not going to prove this criterion. It's, it's quite deep, uh, but it's very useful. It's useful because it tells us that if we want to prove that something, some sequence of random variables 
as a Poisson Dirichlet distribution, we can do some sort of transformation on it. And then we don't have to deal with the Poisson Dirichlet distribution anymore. We have to work with this normalized YI tildes, and we only have to show that they have a limiting distribution, which is a, a beta distribution. And that's much easier. So this observation that it's more useful to look at this uh, YI, normalized YI tildes is, is coming from a work of Donnelly and Grimmett who proved, uh, who gave a new proof for Belinsky theorem. Remember Belinsky proved the convergence to, to Poisson uh, Dirichlet distribution for the largest prime factors. That was here. But later, um, his proof was simplified by Donnelly and Grimmett. And we were able to take, uh, to take the ideas of Donnelly and Grimmett to this setting. And again, do a certain transformation, do a certain science bias permutation on this sequence of uh, largest prime factors. And then on this size bias sequence, we were able to prove the, the convergence in distribution to IID betas. That was the, that was the road that we took. Um, so that, that was the sketch of the proof I wanted to show you. Sorry for running a bit out of time. And uh, I'm, I'm welcome to receive any kind of question. Okay, let's uh, thank Ophir uh, very much. Uh, there are some... Uh, um, uh, right, they managed to write in the chat window this class thing. <laughs> um, okay, and uh, let, let us have questions from the audience. I saw Ze'ev already had one at the end of the chat. I don't know uh, uh, if you saw it, uh, Ophir, or maybe it's been answered already. So I see that Ze'ev asked, does the gem I uniformly distributed in zero one? Well, it depends on the parameter theta. That's a good question. If, if, if theta is one, uh, then the beta distribution is the uniform distribution. Yes, so yes, in the case of theta equals one, which recovers the original uh, result of uh, Bill Inksley, and uh, then, then the UIs are IID on zero one. But in our setting, uh, where I took uh, where we take general f and sample an integer according to these weights of f, then theta can be uh, can be different from one. I ask if the yi's or the xi's oh. are uniformly distributed. So so it's the, it's going to be gem with the same parameters. So the gem that I wrote here, this yi tilde does are are. I, I see. I see what you're asking. I think I understand what you're asking. Um, first of all, this 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 sequence of x each x i will have will have a different distribution. So the first x one, the first x one will just be have a distribution beta with parameters one theta, but x two will already be will be first of all it will be restricted in range, right? It won't be able to get the value one. Um, cause yeah, cause with probability one, X one is positive. So already X two will not be uniform and it will not be beta one theta. I'm not sure what it will be, but you can say it will be the second coordinate of the gem process or the stick breaking process. Maybe people with, from probability will be able to give a better answer because I come from analytic number theory, but I don't think that the X size in general have a nice distribution. That's why you give it a name, because it's not necessarily nice. Are there any other questions? OK, it doesn't seem that there are any other questions. Uh, so uh, thank you all for attending the uh, first um, online uh, Horbit seminar. And uh, thank you, Ophir, for volunteering to give this talk and for giving a really great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, everyone. Thank everybody for coming. Um, OK, so uh, I don't know if we'll have a volunteer uh, for next week for another online talk, but uh, the experience so far was good, and uh, we might uh, indeed have it. Uh, so let's see how uh, things proceed. I'll send an email uh, when I know more.
Okay, so uh, thank you for all for coming. I'll stop the recording now and um, I'll exit the session. Um,